Chapter 8 Inspector Raglan is confident. We looked at each other. You'll have inquiries made at the station, of course, I said. Naturally, but I'm not over sanguine as to the result. You know what that station is like. I did. King's Abbot is a mere village, but its station happens to be an important junction. Most of the big expresses stop there, and trains are shunted, resorted, and made up. It has two or three public telephone boxes. At that time of night, three local trains come in close upon each other to catch the connection with the Express for the North, which comes in at 1019 and leaves at 1023. The whole place is in a bustle, and the chances of one particular person being noticed telephoning or getting into the Express are very small indeed. But why telephone at all? demanded Melrose. That is what I find so extraordinary. There seems no rhyme or reason in the thing. Poirot carefully straightened a china ornament on one of the bookcases. Be sure there was a reason, he said over his shoulder. But what reason could it be? <clears throat> when we know that, we shall know everything. This case is very curious and very interesting. There was something almost indescribable in the way he said those last words. I felt that he was looking at the case from some peculiar angle of his own, and what he saw I could not tell. He went to the window and stood there looking out. You say it was nine o'clock, Dr. Shepard, when you met this stranger outside the gate? He asked the question without turning round. Yes, I replied. I heard the clock, church clock chime the hour. How long would it take him to reach the house? To reach this window, for instance? Five minutes at the outside. Two or three minutes only if he took the path at the right of the drive and came straight here. But to do that, he would have had to know the way. How, how can I explain myself? It would mean that he had been here before, or that he knew his surroundings. That is true, replied Colonel Melrose. We could find out, doubtless, if Mr. Ackroyd had received any strangers during the past week. Young Raymond could tell us that, I said. Or Parker, suggested Colonel Melrose. Ou tous les deux, suggested Poirot, smiling. Colonel Melrose went in search of Raymond, and I rang the bell once more for Parker. Colonel Melrose returned almost immediately, accompanied by the young secretary, whom he introduced to Poirot. Geoffrey Raymond was fresh and debonair as ever. He seemed surprised and delighted to make Poirot's acquaintance. No idea you'd be been living among us incognito, Monsieur Poirot, he said. It will be a great privilege to watch you at work. Hello, what's this? Poirot had been standing just to the left of the door. Now he moved aside suddenly, and I saw that while my back was turned, he must have swiftly drawn out the armchair till it stood in the position Parker had indicated. Want me to sit in the chair whilst you take a blood test? asked Raymond good-humouredly. What's the idea? Monsieur Raymond, this chair was pulled out, so, last night when Mr. Ackroyd was found killed, someone moved it back again into place. Did you do so? The secretary's reply came without a second's hesitation. No, indeed I didn't. I don't even remember that it was in that position, but it must have been if you say so. Anyway, somebody else must have moved it back to its proper place. Have they destroyed a clue in doing so? Too bad. It is of no consequence, said the detective. Of no consequence whatever. What I really want to ask you is this, Monsieur Raymond. Did any stranger come to see Mr. Ackroyd during this past week? The secretary reflected for a minute or two, knitting his brows, and during the pause, Parker appeared in answer to the bell. No, said Raymond at last. I can't remember anyone. Can you, Parker? I beg your pardon, sir. Any stranger coming to see Mr. Ackroyd this week? The butler reflected for a minute or two. There was the young man who came on Wednesday, sir, 
he said at last, from Curtis and Trout, I understood he was. Raymond moved this aside with an impatient hand. Oh, yes, I remember, but that is not the kind of stranger this gentleman means, he turned to Poirot. Mr. Ackroyd had some idea of purchasing a dictaphone, he explained. It would have enabled us to get through a lot more work in a limited time. The firm in question sent down their representative, but nothing came of it. Mr. Ackroyd did not make up his mind to purchase. Poirot turned to the butler. Can you describe this young man to me, my good Parker? He was fair-haired, sir, and very short. Very neatly dressed in a blue serge suit. A very presentable young man, sir, for his station in life. Poirot turned to me. The man you met outside the gate, doctor, was tall, was he not? Yes, I said. Somewhere about six feet, I should say. There is nothing to that, then, declared the Belgian. I thank you, Parker. The butler spoke to Raymond. Mr. Hammett has just arrived, sir, he said. He is anxious to know if he can be of any service, and he would be glad to have a word with you. I'll come at once, said the young man. He hurried out. Poirot looked inquiringly at the chief constable. The family solicitor, Mr. Poirot, said the latter. It is a very busy time for this young Monsieur Raymond, murmured Mr. Poirot. He has the air efficient, that one. I believe Mr. Ackroyd considered him a most able secretary. He has been here how long? Just on two years, I fancy. His duties he fulfills punctiliously. Of that, I am sure. In what manner does he amuse himself? Does he go in for le sport? Private secretaries haven't much time for that sort of thing, said Colonel Melrose, smiling. Raymond plays golf, I believe, and tennis in the summertime. He does not attend the courses? I should say the running of the horses? Race meetings? No, I don't think he's interested in racing. Poirot nodded and seemed to lose interest. He glanced slowly round the study. I have seen, I think, all that there is to be seen here. I, too, looked round. If, the, if those walls could speak, I murmured. Poirot shook his head. A tongue is not enough, he said. They would have to have also ears and eyes. But do not be too sure that these dead things, he touched the top of the bookcase as he spoke, are always dumb. To me they speak sometimes. Chairs, tables, they have their message. He turned away towards the door. What message? I cried. What have they said to you today? He looked over his shoulder and raised one eyebrow quizzically. An open window, he said. A locked door. A chair that apparently moved itself. To all three, I say, why? And I find no answer. He shook his head, puffed out his chest, and stood blinking at us. He looked ridiculously full of his own importance. It crossed my mind to wonder whether he was really any good as a detective. Had his big reputation been built up upon a series of lucky chances? I think the same thought must have occurred to Colonel Melrose, for he frowned. Anything more you want to see, Monsieur Poirot? He inquired brusquely. You would perhaps be so kind as to show me the silver table from which the weapon was taken? After that, I will trespass on your kindness no longer. We went to the drawing room, but on the way, the constable waylaid the colonel, and after a muttered conversation, the latter excused himself and left us together. I showed Poirot the silver table, and after raising the lid once or twice and letting it fall, he pushed open the window and stepped out on the terrace. I followed him. Inspector Radlin had just turned the corner of the house and was coming towards us. His face looked grim and satisfied. So there you are, Mr. Poirot, he said. Well, this isn't going to be much of a case. I'm sorry, too. A nice enough young fellow gone wrong. Poirot's face fell, and he spoke very mildly. I'm afraid I shall not be of much aid to you, then. Next time, perhaps, 
said the inspector soothingly. Though we don't have murders every day in this quiet little corner of the world. Poirot's gaze took on an admiring quality. You have been of a marvelous promptness, he observed. How exactly did you go to work, if I may ask? Certainly, said the inspector. Inspector? Inspector? To begin with, method. That's what I always say, method. Ah, cried the other, that too is my watchword. Method, odor, and the little gray cells. The cells, said the inspector, staring. The little gray cells of the brain, explained the Belgian. Oh, of course. Well, we all use them, I suppose. In a greater or lesser degree, murmured Poirot. And there are two differences in quality. Then there is the psychology of a crime. One must study that. Ah, said the inspector. You've been bitten with all this psychoanalyst stuff. Now I'm a plain man. Mrs. Raglan would not agree, I am sure, to that, said Poirot, making him a little bow. Inspector Raglan, a little taken aback, bowed. You don't understand, he said, grinning broadly. Lord, what a lot of difference language makes. I'm telling you how I set to work. First of all, method. Mr. Ackroyd was last seen alive at a quarter to ten by his niece, Miss Flora Ackroyd. That's fact number one, isn't it? If you say so. Well, it is. At half past ten, the doctor here says that Mr. Ackroyd had been dead at least half an hour. You stick to that, doctor. Certainly, I said, half an hour or longer. Very good. That gives us exactly a quarter of an hour. <laughs> that gives us exactly a quarter of an hour in which the crime must have been committed. I'll make a list of everyone in the house and work through it, setting down their names, where they were, and what they were doing between the hour 9.45 and 10 p.m. He handed a sheet of paper to Poirot. I read it over his shoulder. It ran as follows, written in a neat script. Major Blunt, in billiard room with Mr. Raymond. Ladder confirms. Mr. Raymond, billiard room. See above. Mrs. Ackroyd, 9.45, watching billiard match. Went up to bed, 9.55. Raymond and Blunt watched her up staircase. Miss Ackroyd went straight from her uncle's room upstairs. Confirmed by Parker, also housemaid, Elsie Dale. Servants. Parker went straight to Butler's pantry. Confirmed by housekeeper, Miss Russell, who came down to speak to him at some, about something at 9.47 and remain, remained at least 10 minutes. Miss Russell, as above. Spoke to housemaid Elsie Dale upstairs at 9.45. Ursula Bourne, parlor maid, in her own room until 9.55, then in servants' hall. Mrs. Cooper, cook, in servants' hall. Gladys Jones, second housemaid, in servants' hall. Elsie Dale, upstairs in bedroom, seen there by Miss Russell and Miss Flora Ackroyd. Mary Thripp, kitchen maid, servants' hall. The cook has been here seven years, the parlor maid 18 months, and Parker just over a year. The others are new, except for something fishy about Parker. They all seem quite all right. A very complete list, said Poirot, handing it back to him. I am quite sure that Parker did not do the murder, he added gravely. So is my sister, I struck in, and she's usually right. Nobody paid any attention to my interpolation. That disposes pretty effectually of the household, continued the inspector. Now we come to a very grave point. The woman at the lodge, Mary Black, was pulling the curtains last night when she saw Ralph Payton turn in at the gate and go up towards the house. She is sure of that? I asked sharply. Quite sure. She knows him well by sight. He went past very quickly and turned off by the path to the right, which is a shortcut to the terrace. And what time was that? asked Poirot, who had sat with an immovable face. Exactly twenty-five minutes past nine, said the inspector gravely. There was a silence. 
Then the inspector spoke again. It's all clear enough. It all fits, it fits in without a flaw. At 25 minutes past nine, Captain Peyton is seen passing the lodge. At 9.30 or thereabouts, Mr. Jeffrey Raymond hears someone any asking for money, and Mr. Ackroyd refusing. What happens next? Captain Peyton leaves the same way, through the window. He walks along the terrace, angry and baffled. He comes to the open drawing room window. Say it's now a quarter to ten. Miss Flora Ackroyd is saying good night to her uncle. Major Blunt, Mr. Raymond, and Mrs. Ackroyd are in the billiard room. The drawing room is empty. He steals in, takes the dagger from the silver table, and returns to the study window. He slips off his shoes, climbs in, and, well, I don't need to go into details. Then he slips out again and goes off. And the nerve to go back to the inn. He makes for the station, rings up from there. Why? said Poirot softly. I jumped at the interruption. The little man was leaning forward. His eyes shone with a queer green light. For a moment, Inspector Raglan was taken aback by the question. It's difficult to say exactly why I did that, he said at last, but murderers do funny things. You'd know that if you were in the police force. The cleverest of them make stupid mistakes sometimes, but come along and I'll show you those footprints. We followed him round the corner of the terrace to, to the study window. At a word from Raglan, a police constable produced the shoes which had been obtained from the local inn. The inspector laid them over the marks. They're the same, he said confidently. That is to say, they're not the same pair that actually made these prints. He went away in those. This is a pair just like them, but older. See how the studs are worn down? Surely a great, surely a great many people... Surely a great many people wear shoes with rubber studs in them, asked Poirot. That's so, of course, said the inspector. I shouldn't put so much stress on the footmarks if it wasn't for everything else. A very foolish young man, Captain Ralph Payton, said Poirot thoughtfully, to leave so much evidence of his presence. Ah, well, said the inspector. It was a fine, dry, fine night, you know. He left no prints on the terrace or on the gravel path, but unluckily for him, a spring must have welled up just lately at the end of the path from the drive. See ya? A small graveled path joined the terrace a few feet away. In one spot, a few yards from its termination, the ground was wet and boggy. Crossing this wet place, there were again the marks of footsteps, and amongst them the shoes with rubber studs. Poirot followed the path on a little way, the inspector by his side. You notice the women's footprints? he said suddenly. The inspector laughed. Naturally, but several different women have walked this way, and men as well. It's a regular shortcut to the house, you see. It would be impossible to sort out all the footsteps. After all, it's the ones on the windowsill that are really important. Poirot nodded. It's no good going farther, said the inspector as we came in view of the drive. It's all graveled again here, and odd as it can be. Again, Poirot nodded, but his eyes were fixed on a small garden house, a kind of superior summer house. It was a little to the left of the path ahead of us, and a graveled walk ran up to it. Poirot lingered about until the inspector had gone back towards the house. Then he looked at me. You must have indeed been sent from the good God to replace my friend Hastings, he said with a twinkle. I observe that you do not quit my side. How say you, Dr. Shepherd? Shall we investigate that summer house? It interests me. He went up to the door and opened it. Inside, the place was almost dark. There were one or two rustic seats, a croquet set, and some folded deck chairs. I was startled to observe my new friend. He had dropped to his hands and knees and was crawling about the floor. Every now and then he shook his head as though not satisfied. Finally, he sat back on his heels. Nothing, he murmured. Well, perhaps it was not to be expected, but it would have meant so much. He broke off, stiffening all over. Then he stretched out his hand to one of the rustic chairs. He detached something from one side of it. What is it? I cried. What have you found? He smiled, unclosing his hand so that I should see what lay in the palm of it. A scrap of stiff, white cambric. I took it from him, looked at it curiously, and then handed it back. What do you make of it, eh, my friend? He asked. <laughs>
eyeing me keenly. A scrap torn from a handkerchief, I suggested, shrugging my shoulders. He made another dart and picked up a small quill, a goose quill by the look of it. And that, he cried triumphantly, what do you make of that? I only stared. He slipped the quill into his pocket and looked again at the scrap of white stuff. A fragment of a handkerchief, he mused. Perhaps you are right. But remember this, a good laundry does not starch a handkerchief. He nodded at me triumphantly. Then he put away the scrap carefully in his pocketbook.